We've been in a series, as you know, uh, called The Pursuit of Happiness. Next week, we're going to start a new series called Thrive, Life Off the Escalator. The, the Sermon on the Mount is really divided into three major sections, maybe four, depending on how you, how you cut it up, what, maybe what Jesus was thinking on how he cut it up. But there are definitely clear sections, definitely clear sections on on how it's divided and how Jesus arranged this. And this, this, ser- this sermon that Jesus preaches is so deep. Um, before I get into the service, I need, my wife is giving the whiteboard. You know what the whiteboard means? Does everybody know what the whiteboard means? It means I've either forgotten something or I said something wrong. Okay? Uh, I need to remind, this is not an announcement that we have in the bulletin, but the Delaware Family Life Policy Council is having a, a training uh, workshop for teachers and coaches and leaders for you to know your rights uh, your religious rights and liberties. And so if you're in any one of those spheres, we want to encourage you to go to Connection Corner after the service and find out more information because there's a lot of things happening in our world and in these spheres of influence that we need to know our rights in order to be able to be ambassadors for the gospel. And so there's a lot of rights that we have as American citizens and they will cover them and go over them with you. So that's information's at Connection Corner. That leads into where I want to start this morning with a quote from Sophie Scholl. Somebody, after all, had to make a start. These are the words of Sophie Scholl, a 21-year-old student who spoke these words to the Chief Justice of the People's Court of the Greater German Reich shortly before he ordered her execution. Sophie's story is told by John Stone Street in a practical guide, his book, A Practical Guide to Culture. He writes, on February 22, 1943, her brother Hans and their friend Christopher Probst were convicted of treason in a kangaroo court and sent to the guillotine. Hans Scholl led the underground resistance movement known as the White Rose. From June of 1942 until their arrest, Hans, Sophie, and several others at the University of Munich covertly authored anti-Nazi pamphlets and distributed them on campus and throughout nearby communities. Retribution for their crimes was swift. Within four days, they were detained, accused, tried, convicted, and executed. Within weeks, other members of the White Rose were rounded up and faced similar fates. Raised an anomaly, nominally, that means just a church-going family, but they really weren't born-again Christians or followers of Jesus, raised in a religious home, the Shoals came to real personal faith in Christ while at the university. In the book Fabric of Faithfulness, Stephen Garber describes how their conversions and their actions were built upon their faith in Jesus. Reading the scriptures in light of the challenges presented then by the German culture, And having conversations with their friends about the world and their place in it, meeting with older and wiser people who offered them their time and their books and their information, together they molded a vision of who they were to be as followers of Christ in their generation. Many Germans, including Christians, simply chose to remain silent. Others actually embraced the Nazi belief system an ideology, but the Shoals, living out their faith, drove them to embrace what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called the tempest of living. They got a vision to make a difference in their culture and their world, and on the very day that they were supposed to, Hans was supposed to meet Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he was executed. Often we Christians complain about culture. We need to recognize that we're part of culture, and God has called us, to, and he wants to give us a vision. He wants to give us a mission. He wants to give us influence in our culture to make a difference. Somebody, after all, has to make a start. Today, we're concluding our series, The Beatitudes, which is really the introduction to Jesus' sermon. The Beatitudes of blessed are this person, blessed, blessed, blessed. When Jesus starts this in his sermon, he's really giving an introduction. He's letting people know that he's got something very important to to say. The word blessed means to overflow with happiness. Jesus saying overflowing with happiness are those in the kingdom of heaven. And he describes various things in the Beatitudes that we've covered already. Today we come to the last and probably the most difficult to swallow. As one person would say, it's a difficult bone to chew on. 
Jesus says, blessed, this is his last blessing, happy overflowing with happiness and joy are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets. Let's be honest. This is a hard pill to swallow. Jesus has been saying, blessed, 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 happy, overflowing with happiness is the poor in spirit. Blessed, overflowing with happiness are the meek. Blessed and happy are those that, that, that are hungering and thirsting for righteousness sake. And he goes down this list and he comes to this last beatitude and he says, blessed are you when people reject you, when people lie about you, when people swear falsely about you. And the word persecute, by the way, means to track you down and chase you from city to city. He says, be happy. He says, rejoice, be exceeding glad. I have to admit that my spirituality is not there yet. And people say false things about you. Do you get happy and say, oh, they're lying about me. Praise God. <laughs> On the job, somebody's been sending bad notes to my supervisor, and they cost me a promotion because I'm a follower. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm not there yet. It's a hard pill to swallow, isn't it? It really is. But Jesus says that we're blessed when people do this to us in his namesake. Now, if you're an idiot, he's not saying you're blessed. If you do stupid stuff, he's not saying you're blessed. Blessed are the stupid. He's not saying that. Jesus is saying when you're living for him and you're doing the right thing and people take a stand against you and accuse you of things falsely and, and malign you, he's saying rejoice and be exceeding glad. And what Jesus is saying here is very important to life. You know, psychologists have, have learned that it's very important for people, if they want good mental health, to be able to embrace the reality that life is difficult. Scott Peck's famous book, The Road Less Traveled, many of you may have written, uh, read it, not read, written it, read it because he, he sold millions of copies and it was very popular in the last generation. And he talks about in his book, he starts by saying, life is difficult. Life is difficult because it has a series of problems that we have to face and overcome. And he goes on to say right out of the gate, right at the beginning of his book, he says that the failure or the tendency to avoid problems, which we all have a tendency to do, all of us have this aversion to problems. All of us are born with this aversion to life being difficult. We want life to be a utopia. We want life to go smoothly. We want life, or am I just talking to myself? I don't like it. Do you when things go backwards? I'm a saver. I've been a saver my whole life. What about you? Some of you are spenders. Don't raise your hand. There's two kinds of people on the earth, savers and spenders. Praise God, I married a saver. Patty still has Easter candy from 15 years ago in their freezer. When it comes to candy, I'm a spender. But I've been a saver, and so there's savers and there's spenders, and that we need all those kind of people in the earth. But one of the things I don't like is when I, if I can't, if I can't make, if I can't save more money this year, at least I don't want to go backwards. How many can say amen to that? Amen. Jesus is saying, blessed are they that can face the reality that being a disciple is difficult. Amen. You'll be happier if you get off of this or get off the train or out of the illusion that being a Christ follower just means that everything is going to be peachy and wonderful, God is good, and everything's going to be easy. Because, folks, I promise you, if you live long enough, that theology will crash. Amen. There are seasons. We don't always have trouble. If you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you'll find that there are seasons of blessing. Everything's going great. You're in a groove. Everything's wonderful. But then there's these right turns of persecution and problems, and that's the way life is. Life has wonderful things in it. There are so many good things to think about life, but there are also some down things in life. And so Scott Peck goes on to say, he says that one of the major primary causes of mental illness is the refusal to embrace the fact that life is difficult. 
that actually causes so many problems in our lives. It's the reason why people take drugs. It's the reason why people pursue pleasure. It's because we're trying to escape the problems and pain of life because we don't want to embrace them. We don't want to face them. We want life to be easy. And so what Jesus is telling us here is a psychologically verifiable truth. And if you want to be overflowing in happiness in life, you have to admit to yourself and be willing to face the fact that sometimes life sucks. What's amazing about it, Peck says, is that once you do that, the things that are sucky, now he doesn't say it like that, it's written in the 80s. I'm using modern vernacular. He says, once you admit that there's some bad things, those sucky things don't have the power over you that they once did. And it's the same way with following Jesus, even more so. Jesus is not saying, be happy because you're having problems all the time. He's not saying, be happy about it. What he's saying is it's possible for his followers, those who follow him, that in the midst of the suckiness of life, you can still be happy. You can still have joy. You can still be on the top. You don't have to be on the bottom. Even though there are things that are not good in your life, you can still be happy. I want that in my life. What about you? There's three reasons Jesus gives here that we can be happy that will help you and help me when life gets difficult, when problems come our way, To help get us through. You know, one of the things that I'm learning now at at 46 years of age. (laughs) Plus 10. As I look into the future, I realize something recently. It gets easier, but all our problems don't go away. That there is no... You know, you're going to retire, and then everything gets easy. Things get easier and simpler, but they don't get easy. There's always going to be some challenges and things you're going to have to rise to as long as we are alive because there is a battle going on between good and evil in the earth, and we sometimes get stuck in the middle. It doesn't matter whether you're 8 or 80. You and I are engaged in that battle. So what Jesus is trying to do is arm us with a mindset that we can endure those seasons and still have joy. When the things are going wrong, you can still have joy and happiness and peace. And people are going to look at you at times. The Bible calls it a peace that surpasses understanding. People are going to look at you in those seasons and say, how in the world are you keeping it together? You ought to be an absolute wreck. That's what God wants for our lives. And then he wants these things to change, don't get me wrong, but he gives three reasons that things that you can hold on to when life doesn't unfold the way you think it should, three reasons to hang on to Jesus even when life gets bad because, folks, the number one reason people turn away from God is because life gets hard and they expect God to show up like a genie, poof, everything is going to be good because he has all power. He should just pave the road. It should have no potholes in it. And, folks, Jesus never says that anywhere in the Scriptures. In fact, he says, you're going to have all the help you need, but (laughs) you're going to have an added problem too. You're going to need my help. And he wants to help us. Three things he says in this text. First of all, he says, blessed are those that are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The first thing Jesus is telling us that we can be happy and overflow with joy because we have a part in a much bigger story. There's something bigger going on in this world than just you and me as individuals. We as individuals are very, very important. You as an individual are the apple of God's eye. But you have to remember that you and I, it's not just all about us. There's a bigger story. And that is the cry, the hunger, I believe, for the generations that are following us is they're looking for a bigger story. They've been told for years, it's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you. And they're saying, there's got to be more than all about me. And they're in search of a story that's bigger than theirs. And when you find a story that's bigger than yours, it gives your life meaning. It gives it purpose. It gives it stamina and strength. Russell Moore writes in his book, Onward, there's two aspects of the kingdom of heaven 
that really kind of confuse us. We like one over the other. He likens the one, he says, they're both illustrated. One is proliferation. That is, is that the kingdom of God is going to advance and has been advancing in the earth since Jesus was on the earth. And it's continuing to proliferate. It's continuing to spread. In fact, I was sharing on, on Wednesday night how right now there's more Muslims receiving Christ in the Middle East than ever in the history of the world. The kingdom is proliferating. The kingdom is growing. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, that, that a woman hood, hidden in, in, in a flower, and it became leaven through the whole loaf. The kingdom of God is expanding. And Moore says that that's illustrated by the cathedrals. The church throughout history built cathedrals. Have you ever been in a cathedral? My wife and I had the privilege a year and a half ago to, we had to fly, when we were going to Africa, we had to fly through Paris to go to Africa. It's the only way you can get there. At least the only way we knew to get there other than by boat. We didn't want to take a boat or a train. But we decided between flights, we decided to stay a couple days in Paris. So we got a chance to go see Notre Dame before it caught on fire. Pictures don't do it justice. They really don't. You, you stand in front of that building, I'm sure today even, after the fire, you stand in front of that, and we saw several other cathedrals. You know, we don't have a lot of cathedrals in Sussex County. You leave those cathedrals inspired. Cathedrals inspire us. They're bigger. They reach the heaven. They're like they're reaching to touch God. They're beautiful. Now, one of the things that we found about the cathedrals inside is you need more light than you can ever possess. They're pretty dark on the inside. So we had to get used to all the pictures you see on the internet. Man, they have really flooded them with lights. But there is a beauty and a mystique and there's an inspiration just standing. When we were standing in Notre Dame to think that these, some of these walls were 12, 800 years old to 1,000 years old. And that people worship there. There was an inspiration. And that's what Jesus is talking about. He's saying there is an inspiration in the kingdom. That, that you're part of something bigger to where when you get up in the morning. And that's why your presence at church is so important. That's why we need to gather. You and I need to gather so we can look in the room and realize we're not the only ones trying to live for Jesus. There's other people out there that love Jesus Christ. They may be getting their brains beat in. But they love him just as much if not more than you do. And you, we need to remember that. We're part of something bigger. Well, Russell, goes, Russell Moore goes on to say, the other icon of Christianity that we need to grab a hold of is the catacombs. Because the catacombs in the early, late, or I should say late Roman period are where Christians had to hide from the persecution of Rome. Proliferation. The church spread and the Roman government could not stop the church from spreading. So there was 10 Roman persecutions where they tried to stop the church of Jesus Christ. And it eventually grew so powerful that it took over the Roman Empire. But they were persecuted. And so the Christians would have to thin their herds sometimes and, and really get to know who was really a believer. And they would go underground in the catacombs. And they were tombs. And we need both. We need to remember we're part of a bigger picture. Now, if we just focus on the cathedral, which is what our temptation in America is today. The American church, especially the evangelical church, is on a, is on a slippery slope. Wanting everything to be about jacking people up and entertaining people and exciting people. And there's, certain, there's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. But we have to beware because I can promise you, I've been serving Christ since 17 years of age. I can promise you there's a lot of excitement. We've had more excitement than downtime. But there have been times it's not been so exciting serving Jesus. There have been times that we've had to go to the catacombs. And if we stay, in the, if we stay just in the cathedrals, we'll just start getting thinking that we're going to take everything over and we're going to advance the kingdom. And that's when bad things have happened historically in the church. When the church gets in power and th starts thinking she is something... And it begins to have power, and we begin to botch it up. We actually play better as a visiting team. I shared with you that before. But there's also a danger to having the catacomb mentality. When things get bad, when things get tough, it's very easy to start thinking that we're the only ones going through this. And we begin to get a small mindset, and we begin to shrink down of us four and no more. And this thing isn't going to work, and there's nobody getting saved. But I can promise you throughout the world, the church, is the, the church of Jesus Christ is the fastest growing religious movement in the earth. 
We just don't see it on our news. We're not told about it. It's stuff that we're not seeing on the front news. We get all the bad news. But Jesus is saying, look, when things get tough, remember you're part of something bigger. Remember the cathedrals. Be inspired that you're not, you're not in this thing alone, but that you actually have people with you. You're part of a bigger body of people. But remember the catacombs because they anchor us. They keep us just as the cathedral reaches towards heaven and inspires us to reach up and to reach out. The catacombs bring us back down to earth and remind us that we're still living in a fallen planet where bad things can happen to good people. And what's even harder is good things can happen to bad people. Isn't that one tough to take? Isn't it tough to take when good things happen to people that are just slimy? And you wonder, Lord, if you got that billion dollars to me, what I could do for the poor? Have you ever thought that? I have. A few times I've looked at some billionaires and said, Lord, I'd handle that money much better than they would. Thank you. (laughs) Folks, when things get hard, and they won't always be hard, remember that you're part of a bigger story, God's story. God is working something out in this earth that we're part of, that we get to be a part of for 70, 80, 90 years if we're strong. And there's a generation coming behind us, and there's a generation that's gone before us. The second reason we can be, stay happy in the midst of all this stuff and be blessed and overflow with joy is Jesus says that we, are, we have a purpose to live for. People are in search of purpose today. One of my favorite writers, Oz Guinness, writes in his book, The Call, a book I highly recommend that you all read. But he says, people today have so many things in in the modern world, particularly in the Western world, we have so many things to live with, but so few things to live for. We're crying out for meaning and purpose. And I, I will make a prediction here, and you might want to write this down, hold me accountable. I'm not prophesying, but I'm making a prediction. The group of people in America that figure out how to give the next several generations purpose is going to get them. People are looking for purpose. Why else would Rick Warren sell 50 million plus books called The Purpose Driven Life? 50 million, that's one out of seven Americans. It's quite amazing. People are looking for purpose. Somebody, after all, has to make a start. We're the somebody. We're part of the bigger story that God wants to use us as the somebody, and we are the starters. We are the ones that God, our purpose in life is to to advance the kingdom and to start many things and then pass them on to other people. We are the starters. There's a story. It's kind of old, but it kind of fits here. It's, It's called, That's Not My Job. It's a story about four people named everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. Some of you might have heard the story. There was an important job to be done. And everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. And it ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. You're the somebody. You're the starter. Jesus talks about three, he uses three metaphors, three examples in this text. First, he says, this is speaking of who we are, our purpose in the earth. He says, they so persecuted the prophets. You're like the prophets in the Old Testament. Now, we could spend another hour, and I could just illustrate for you in the life of the prophets. I won't do that. You go read the Old Testament for yourself or show up digging deeper in one of these classes, and you'll learn. The prophets were very special people that God used in the Old Testament. He said, you're like them. Russell Kirk, in his book, I'm forgetting the title. It's in my notes somewhere. I'll think of it in a minute. Oh, The Roots of American Order. He says, That the prophets in the Old Testament, I love his definition, were people that said no to their society. They were people that came along and the prophets were sent when the the culture was going south. God didn't send them until they were going south. They're like like the warning light, the idiot light on your dashboard. When When the oil light on your car lights up in the dashboard, you ought to stop. How do I know? I bought a car when I was 18 years of age, a big giant Ford LTD. It was about 50 feet long. John, you remember that car? 
It had a trunk so big, big, I had a jacuzzi in there, a bed in there. I mean, it was huge. A big old LTD got 12 miles to the gallon. But it was garage kept. It had 72,000 miles on it. It was beautiful from one end to the other end, if you like that kind of car. And I kind of did because I was kind of a nerd. I got it from a used car lot. I didn't drive it very far because they only put a little bit of gas in it. So when I test drove it, it was fine. By the time I got it home, the oil light was coming on. And I kept driving it. 500 hours later, it drove again. The prophets were like that warning light on, the lab, on, on their dashboard to society saying, you might not want to do that. They were like the ones that said no. Now, let's be honest. Do you like people telling you no? He said, you're like the prophets of old. That's how they treated them. Why did they treat them that way? Because nobody likes to hear no. Do you like to hear no? You know, I'm on a diet. I told you that last week. I've lost three pounds this week and kept it off. Praise God. Hallelujah. All week long, Patty say, no. No, you can't have that. No. Last week, I said, call the lawyer. I want some ice cream. She's sitting eating a bowl of moose tracks. I'm eating diet stuff. No won't get you <laughs> winning any popularity awards. But our culture needs us when they get off base for us to say, no, that's not good. Now, we're not talking about being mean-spirited. These people are not mean-spirited. People yelling and shouting, cursing people, you know, mocking people in the name of God. That's not what the Bible talks about at all. These people, Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. He weeped over what was happening with his people. We have a heart of compassion, but we say out of compassion... That's probably not a good thing for you to do. It's going gonna, it's gonna to bite you. Then he says, rejoice. He says in verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. So he uses another example of salt. I mean, I don't know what it is, but lately they've been giving me props. I don't know if my sermons have been so bad or what, but they're saying, you really need some help. This is filled with salt. People used to carry a salt bag around. We read this about salt. All we think about is salt on the, on the counter or on the, on the table with a salt shaker. We can go get salt anytime we want. It really is no big deal. It's not very valuable. I mean, you can buy a thing of salt, what, for about a dollar, a dollar and a half? But back in Jesus' day, salt was valuable. It was the only thing that they had to preserve meat. It was so valuable that, that people, the word salary actually comes from the word salt. You ever heard the phrase, you're not worth your salt? That means you're not worth your salary. It's bad if the boss tells you that. Salt was valuable. Salt was important. So when Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth, he's talking about the impact that salt would have. In fact, they would, they, salt was so valuable that they would carry these little bags with them. And when they made a contract with people, they would take a little bit of salt out of their bag and they would sprinkle it. I don't have another bag, but they would sprinkle a little bit of salt in the other person's bag, and the other person would put salt in their bag because it symbolized that you can't get your salt back and you better keep your word. Salt was valuable. Salt was valuable because it, it preserved food. We know that. I've already said that because they didn't have a lot of preservatives. You know, when you, when you read a label back in Jesus' day, you got a loaf of bread, it said bread, flour. Today it's monocybic whatever sorbic and all this other stuff right you know because they're all preservatives that's the reason why you know if you make a cake with just natural things in three days it'll be stale well not in my house because it won't last that long but the reason why your bread lasts so long is it has preservatives they didn't have that they had salt so they'd salt everything down and it preserved but not only that it healed you know, what happens, you go to the dentist, you get a tooth pulled or get worked on a tooth. What do they tell you to do? They tell you to, to, to wash your mouth out with salt water. Why? Because it'll clean that wound. It'll, it'll keep infection from coming in. And we're like salt. We're like the prophets. We're like salt. Jesus says, you have a purpose in the earth. And he's saying, when you fulfill that purpose, you're going to have problems. When you're, when you're trying to be a prophet to the world, there's going to be some opposition. When you're trying to be salt, there's going to be some people that are going to not quite like what you're doing because we're like the nail that sticks up what happens to the nail that sticks up it gets hammered down but he's saying happy are you 
overflowing with joy if you're my follower and I'm in you through the power of the Holy Spirit. Overflowing with joy so that you can fulfill your purpose in the earth. And folks, when you find your purpose in Christ, when you begin to find out why God made you and what he's trying to get done through your life, it will become a tree of life to you. That's why I encourage everybody to get a life verse. I have a life verse. It's kind of like, remember the old Christopher Reeves Superman movie? Christopher Reeves in one of the movies, he gets injured and he goes back and he gets that crystal and it heals him. Now, I know that's kind of new agey, but I'm kind of using a modern illustration. That's what a life verse will do to you. I'm not talking about just a verse you like. I'm talking about a verse when you read it, the Holy Spirit says to you, that is what I want you to do with your life. When life gets hard, when what you're doing gets difficult, when people aren't always cheering for you, when the fans go away, when, when people are mis misrepresenting you, when things are going backwards instead of forward, you will do like I have done many times. I take that life verse out, and I say it to myself. I read it to myself. I speak it to God, and I say, God, this is what I want to do with my life. And it don't matter how many people don't like me. I don't care how hard it is. Get a life verse. Mine is Ezra 7.10. Ezra devoted himself to study God's word, to do it, and to teach statutes in Israel. Folks, that has kept me alive when nothing else has kept me alive, and it'll keep you alive. You have a purpose in the earth to be salt, to be like a prophet. Now, the prophet said many yeses, but they said no to some things that were wrong and evil. And the third one he uses here, he says, you are the light of the world. Salt speaks of our invisible witness. You can go places. You don't always have to talk. You can just show up. Have you ever noticed that when you show up certain places, people stop using certain language? You know, one of the things I hate to do when I go out, like to buy a car or whatever, I used to buy cars at different places. Now I have a guy that takes care of me. But, but back in the day when I had to buy cars wherever I could find them, I used to not tell them I was a pastor. Because I told them a pastor, they, they found Jesus real quick. I remember one day we were driving, I was driving a van. I told a guy, I said, I'd like to see a, a Chrysler, a Dodge or Chrysler van. He took me to a Ford. And we're driving down the road and he's cussing up a storm. Every other word is an F word. And he's effing this and effing that. I'm sorry, I'm, you know, I'm just saying he was using bad language. I mean, literally he was. And he turned to me and said, well, what do you do for a living? Well, I said, well, I'm a pastor. He found Jesus right there. <laughs> Salt. Light. That used to bother me because I tell you what bothers me about it. I want people to be real around me. You don't have to fake around me. Amen. If you don't love Jesus, that's your problem. I'm going to love you where you are. I love him. I'm serving Jesus. Whether you serve him or not, I'm going to serve him. Be who you are. Be authentic, be real, don't fake around me. I don't want to be fake, you'd be fake. But it's amazing how it influences people. And sometimes a lot of people do that out of respect. Receive it as such. Salt and light. City set on a hill, Jesus says, cannot be hidden. There is a visible witness that God wants for your life. There's an invisible and there's a visible. You can be happy in the midst of persecution and problems in your life because you're part of a bigger story. God is doing something in and through you that has meaning and purpose that's going to linger here past your life. You're handing off something to a next generation, to other people that's going to live on beyond you. You can be, be, be happy and overflowing with joy in the midst of all kinds of setbacks because you know your purpose. God has a purpose for your life. He he has a part for you to play, a purpose for you to fulfill. And thirdly, you can be happy in the midst of persecution and problems because you have a promise that you can hold on to. This is where it really gets good. Jesus says, rejoice and be exceeding glad, verse 12, for great is your reward in heaven. Now, what's interesting is all through the New Testament, I challenge you to read the New Testament and mark every time it contrasts heaven to earth. You'll find it there all throughout the New Testament. Reward in heaven. There's a reward coming in heaven. 
Nothing you do, nothing you suffer, nothing you sacrifice will be forgotten by God. Jesus said in one place in Matthew 10, I think it's verse 42, he said, even a person who gives you a cup of cold water in my name, because you're my disciple, they'll not want for the reward. In other words, every little thing anybody ever does for God's glory will be rewarded. I don't know about you, but that's an encouragement. You're not forgotten. Sometimes you feel forgotten in the corner. Sometimes you feel maligned. Sometimes you feel like people treat you like a moron, and they do. Sometimes people take things from you. But hang in there because God has not forgotten you. That's the story of Esther, story of Mordecai. I don't have time to get into all that. But let me give you another encouraging word. Jesus only focuses there in heaven because he's focusing on something in the Sermon on the Mount. But in Mark chapter 10, Jesus is talking to his disciples at one place. And disciples come to Jesus and say, now, Jesus, we've been following you. Peter says, look, we've left everything and followed you, Jesus. Remember, we're talking about a rabbi. They're following Rabbi Jesus. So Jesus answered and said, surely I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or wife or children or lands to follow. Next verse. For my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time. It's not just in heaven somewhere. Jesus says, you'll receive a hundredfold now. Let me encourage you. Don't get greedy. Don't, don't go to the prosperity gospel, but don't go to the poverty gospel. Stay in the word of God. Jesus said, you're going to face persecution and problems, but you can still be happy because you have a part to play in a bigger story. My kingdom is, being, is, is expanding throughout the earth. Yeah, you have a purpose in life that God wants to use you. He wants to work through you. He wants to bless you. You're still going to get opposition because he goes on to say in Mark, he says, look, you're going to get all these things with persecution, he goes on to say. But he's saying, you're going to get rewarded not only in the future in heaven, you're going to get rewarded right now. Be happy. Be happy, but serve Jesus. Folks, I can't shout it loud enough. I can't push it hard enough. But to tell you, that if you really want lasting happiness... Throw yourself at the mercy of Jesus and offer him everything you are. I promise you, you'll never regret it. Let me just leave with a few thoughts. A good friend of mine died a couple years ago. Somebody I went to school with. Somebody I played Little League with. I went to his house. Little League season particularly, I spent more weekends at his house and his brother's house than I spent on my own. We played baseball and football all through our younger years into high school till we graduated. And he passed away about three or four years ago. And he passed away young, relatively young, because he didn't live for the Lord. He lived, he never grew up. He did what he wanted. He played hard. He did whatever he wanted, whenever he wanted. And his life was cut short. Then I looked at my life. I told my wife just the other day. I said, every major phase in my life, I've been cheated. In high school, I was class president. Big man on campus, even though it was a small school. Big fish in a small, po- in a small pond. But I was a big fish. <laughs> Stricken with epilepsy eight weeks into school. The last, the best years of my high school years flushed down the toilet. And I could, I could go through seasons and seasons of my life. And when I get in a bad rut, who do you, what do you think the devil whispers in my ear? Because he does the same thing to you. But then I began to think, well, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. God healed me. God restored everything I have in my life. Everything I have in my life. Everything of value. All goes back to the day I said yes to Jesus. And I'm a happy man. Do I have problems? Yep. 
Do you have problems? Yeah. But Jesus is telling us. If you'll follow me, I'm not talking about just saying a prayer and getting your ticket punched to go to heaven. I'm talking about you choose to follow you, not, not being a fanatic. I was a fanatic in my early days. Ask my sister, she's right here. I needed my head examined. In fact, it was empty. But it's full now. Might be full of something, but it's full. Follow Jesus. Give him your life. I promise you by experience that what he says here is true. He will reward you. He will give you purpose. You will overflow with happiness even when the days suck. And that's what I believe our world is looking for. Father, Bless these people, your people. Everybody is at different places. Everybody's going through different things. Some are on highs right now. Bless, I pray those highs last longer than they can ever conceive of. Some, Lord, are in the middle. And some, Lord, are going through hard times. Wherever they are, may this word by the Holy Spirit penetrate their heart. And may it become a source of strength. May they begin to wake up in the morning and say, I have a purpose in the earth. I have a part to play. And I got a promise I can hold on to. Lord, you're with me. You're going to get me through this. And I'm not going to quit on you. I'm not going to quit on my church family. I'm not going to quit on my family. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to quit. Because I can be happy. No matter what my external circumstances or in my life. Lord, that's what I want. Father, give it to all your people. And make this church group of people a force for the kingdom of God in the earth that hell shudders when it thinks of. Father, for those families out there that are struggling to make ends meet and bless them, Lord, with, with resources and for health care and people struggling with health issues and education. and Father, all these things, God, you have the resources. Father, reward your people now. And Lord, as we just surrender our lives to you, Father, prove yourself strong that your word is true on behalf of your people. Oh, we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, be happy. You can be happy. If you're not happy, you want to talk to somebody, send me an email. We'll be glad to set you out. Talk to you. We got people that are smarter than I am. If you need help, we'll get you some help. But hold on. Hang in there. If you're a first-time guest, we'd like to invite you to the starting point in the back. If you would like to know more about Jesus Christ or you need prayer for anything, there'll be some folks that would love to talk to you right here up in the front of the church that would love to talk with you. May God bless you. Make sure you take a few minutes. Get a cup of coffee. Say hello to somebody you don't know. There are people people here that don't know each other. Say it. I know that's a stretch for introverts, but stretch. You'll be happy anyway. Okay? Nobody's going to throw a rock at you. Nobody's going to spill their coffee on you. Say hello to one another before you go out. Have a great day. Remember Wednesday night services. May God bless you. Be a force for good. Be salt. Be light. Be happy. Be blessed. We'll see you next week.